If you have your Bibles, you can open them to Genesis 29. Today's sermon is called Hardship and Maturity. Uh, We'll be studying through Genesis 29. Uh, As you know, we've been following the life of Jacob for some time now, and uh, I've been challenging some of our long-held presuppositions about some of these stories. Um, I argued that Jacob is not the cowardly deceiver that he's often made out to be, who tricked his masculine brother, cheating him out of his birthright. Instead, I've sort of postulated that Jacob was the righteous son and God's choice for covenant succession. And Isaac aged, as Isaac aged, his eyes grew dim and his appetites grew carnal and he was going to disobey God, but Rebekah acted righteously to save her family and the covenant. Now, as, there, as with everything that you hear from the pulpit, whether it's, it's this pulpit or some pulpit that you see on YouTube, some celebrity pastor, your task is always to be a good Berean to test what you hear with the infallible word of God. We're not explicitly told how to interpret some of these events. Jacob and Rebekah are not chastised or reprimanded, so we cannot assume that what they did was treacherous. Now, we are explicitly told that Rebekah was the Christ, and we aren't, sorry, explicitly told that Rebekah was the Christ figure in that story. We have to interpret scripture with scripture and do our best to understand these stories that take place over 4,000 years ago. Now, where we are in the story now is that Esau exploded with anger and plotted to kill Jacob, we're told. And so Isaac and Rebekah send Jacob to Laban to escape his brother and to find a wife. And in the wilderness, on the way to Haran, Jacob encounters God and he sees a vision of a ladder or a stairway of some kind going to heaven. And he names that place Bethel. And he vows he's going to return to that place to build a proper place of worship at some point. And that's where we're going to pick up the story. So we're going to come to Genesis chapter 29. Let's read it together and then we'll pray to ask God to bless our study of it. Genesis 29 starting in verse 1. Then Jacob went on in his journey and came to the land of the people of the east. And he looked and he saw a well in the field and behold, three flocks of sheep lying beside it. For out of that well, the flocks were watered. The stone on the well's mouth was large. And when all the flocks were gathered there, the shepherds would roll the stone from the mouth of the well and water the sheep and put the stone back in its place over the mouth of the well. Jacob said to them, my brothers, where do you come from? They said, we are from Haran. He said to them, do you know Laban, the son of Nahor? They said, we know him. And he said to them, is it well with him? And they said, it is well. And see, Rachel, his daughter, is coming with the sheep. He said, behold, it is still high day. It is not time for the livestock to be gathered together. Water the sheep and go pasture them. But they said, we cannot until all the flocks are gathered together and the stone is rolled from the mouth of the well. Then we water the sheep. While he was still speaking with them, Rachel came with her father's sheep, for she was a shepherdess. Now, as soon as Jacob saw Rachel, the daughter of Laban, his mother's brother, and the sheep of Laban, his mother's brother, Jacob came near and rolled the stone from the well's mouth and watered the flock of Laban, his mother's brother. Then Jacob kissed Rachel and wept aloud. And Jacob told Rachel that he was her father's kinsman and that he was Rebekah's son, and she ran and told her father. As soon as Laban heard the news about Jacob, his sister's son, He ran to meet him and embraced him and kissed him and brought him to his house. Jacob told Laban all these things, and Laban said to him, Surely you are my bone and my flesh. And he stayed with him a month. Then Laban said to Jacob, Because you are my kinsman, should you therefore serve me for nothing? Tell me, what shall your wages be? Now Laban had two daughters. The name of the older was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah's eyes were weak, but Rachel was beautiful in form and appearance. Jacob loved Rachel, and he said, I will serve you seven years for your younger daughter, Rachel. Laban said, It is better that I give her to you than than I should give her to any other man. Stay with me. So Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed to him but a few days because of the love that he had for her. Then Jacob said to Laban, Give me my wife that I may go into her. For my time is completed. So Laban gathered together all the peoples of the place and made a feast. But in the evening he took his daughter Leah and brought her to Jacob, and he went into her. 
Laban gave his female servant Zilpah to his daughter Leah to be her servant. And in the morning, behold, it was Leah. And Jacob said to Laban, what is this that you have done to me? Did I not serve you for Rachel? Why then have you deceived me? Laban said, it is not done It is not so done in our country to give the younger before the firstborn. Complete the week for this one, and we will give you the other also in return for serving me another seven years. Jacob did so and completed her week. Then Laban gave him his daughter Rachel to be his wife. Laban gave his female servant Bilhah to his daughter Rachel to be her servant. So Jacob went into Rachel also, and he loved Rachel more than Leah and served Laban another seven years. So that's God's word to us this morning. Let's pray and ask God to bless our study of it. Heavenly Father, as we come before you now, we pray that you would speak to us from your word. We pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts would be acceptable and pleasing to you, our rock and our redeemer. We pray, Lord, that you would silence my lips from saying anything that's not true of you or true of your word. We pray that your spirit would be here not only helping me to articulate everything that you've laid on my heart, but helping all of us to hear and to understand and to apply your word to our very lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, so this is a, this is a very strange text to us. It's hard for us to sort of imagine a scenario like this, um, but let's make the most sense out of it as we can. And let's start by starting to understand the story, and then we'll get to a big idea that I think will, will be helpful for us, even though the details of the story are somewhat foreign. So the first thing that's going on in the story is that after a long journey, Jacob meets his future bride, Rachel. After a long journey, Jacob meets his future bride, Rachel. You have to remember that Jacob has been traveling for some time, right? We saw him in the wilderness before he got to Haran. That's where he had the vision of the ladder or the stairwell where the angels were ascending and descending, and he saw Yahweh at the top of that staircase. This has been a long journey journey. And this is an emotional outburst. We see Jacob get very emotional with Rachel. Um, Some of the ladies in the church might have thought that doesn't seem like a very good first impression to just kind of walk up and kiss her and then start crying. But you have to understand where some of this emotion is coming from. Jacob has just arrived at his destination. He's traveled about 600 miles. That's a lot of distance. And he's done so without GPS. So you can imagine, if you're, if you're walking and you're, and you're traveling 600 miles, that would take not only a good number of days journey, but when you get there, knowing that you arrived in the right place, when you could have gone in any direction, right? I mean, you're out there and you have the sun to guide you, and I'm sure that they had some, um, some sort of crude instruments to uh, navigate with, but uh, they essentially did this by the stars and by the sky, And so to arrive in his destination 600 miles away, he's emotional. He gets here. He got to his kinsmen. And of course, Esau didn't overtake him on his journey, right? He's anticipating this entire journey. I'm sure he's looking over his shoulder, looking at the horizon, trying to see if Esau is on his way to kill him because he knows that Esau wants him dead. He knows the explosive temper of his brother. And to find himself in the right place, surrounded by friendly people who are associated with his relatives, This is an emotional response by Jacob. Now, the text here seems to be saying that there are multiple flocks and multiple shepherds, and that they wait for all of the flocks to arrive before pulling water from the well. Now, there could be a couple reasons for this. It could be done, it could be because of the size of the stone. The text actually indicates the size of the stone twice, that it's a very large stone, so it could be that it needed all the shepherds there working together to get the stone off the well, in which case... Jacob's strength here is on display. It could also simply be that they waited for everybody so that it was fair. But there's a few things that we see about Rachel. So Rachel shows up, and one of the first things that we notice is that she's a shepherdess. Now this is odd to us because we haven't seen a shepherdess before. All of the shepherds have been associated with the patriarchs. But Rachel is a shepherdess. She's tending her father's sheep. So what are we to make of that? Well, I think one of the things that I want you to see in this whole chapter is that this whole chapter is sort of a way of foreshadowing the nation of Israel, right? The nation of Israel has been prophesied. God has told Abraham, from you, I'm going to make a great nation. I'm going to make your name great, and I'm going to multiply you. But we haven't seen a nation come out of this yet, right? It's it's still been a family. It's been a substantial household under Abraham, a substantial household under Isaac, 
but it's still a household, not a nation. And so I think we're seeing the foreshadowing of Israel. We know that Jacob is going to become Israel, both by name and in practicality. We know that he's the new Abraham, to whom it was promised that he would make a great nation. They are, um, I think, Jacob and Rachel, they are the sort of the patriarch and the bride of God's new people. So what are we to make of the fact that she's a shepherd or a shepherdess? Well, Jacob is a shepherd, she's a shepherdess, and they are going to shepherd God's flock that will come from them. I think that's what we're to make of this. And, of course, right away, he's into her. Now, we, we can't take that simply because he kissed her. We don't want to, that, that, the, the kiss here, we shouldn't read into that like this is a makeout session of any kind. Jacob goes and he kisses her, and the same word that's used for her, him kissing her is the same word that's used for Laban kissing Jacob. So whatever you picture in terms of Jacob kissing Rachel, it's the same thing that Laban does to Jacob. So let's be careful what we picture in our minds. But Jacob is into her as soon as he sees her. The second thing that we notice, so he rolls the stone away, likely a show of his, his own strength, show, rolls the stone away and tells Rachel who he is. Rachel runs off and tells Laban. Laban comes and welcomes him. So the second thing that we notice in the story is that at first, Jacob was welcomed into the family, but after a month, Laban turned on Jacob. Now, there's some explaining to do here. Look at verse 13. It says, as soon as Laban had heard the news about Jacob, his sister's son, he ran to meet him and embraced him and kissed him and brought him into his house. Jacob told Laban all these things, and Laban said to him, surely you are, bone of, my, uh, you are of my bone and my flesh. And he stayed with him a month. Now the text actually says there he stayed with him a moon of days, which means sort of a lunar cycle. So he stayed with him a month. So verse 15 is sort of a, there, there's a transition that takes place here. He stays with him for a month, and he says, you are my bone and my flesh. Now, anybody who's been reading Genesis would recognize immediately, bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh is exactly what Adam said when he saw Eve. Now, that wasn't a romantic, I'm, I'm super attracted to this person. That was, he, looked at all, he had looked at all the animals and a helper was not suited for him. None of those animals were like him. None of them were made in the image of God. None of them were human. So when he sees Eve, Eve was first his sister and then he, she was his bride. So this language of bone and flesh is to say, essentially, we're family. And so he welcomes him as family. But in verse 15, it says, Then Laban said to Jacob, Because you are my kinsman, should you therefore serve me for nothing? Tell me, what shall your wages be? Now, immediately, just because of how it's rendered, we, we read that and we think there's, there's kind of two ways of reading it. And the first way seems a bit more natural, where it says Laban, Laban is sort of being generous here. right? I don't want to take advantage of my family member here, so tell me what you want to be paid. That sounds pretty generous, right? You tell me what you want to be paid. The second sort of reading of this is that Laban is actually being greedy and essentially saying, look, you're, though he was first welcomed his family, and, and family obviously has right to the household. Family can go into my fridge, right? Strangers can't go into my fridge. And so the idea here is now he's beginning to treat Jacob as one of his hired servants because he's going to pay him. He doesn't just get room and board. He doesn't get to come and be a part of the family. He's not treating him as a son, but now he's going to give him wages. So we're to read into that, I think, something has gone differently. And the only thing I can think of, and again, we are speculating a little bit here, but one of the things that I can think of is if you think of Genesis 24, when Eleazar of Damascus showed up and came to Laban looking for Rebekah, right, a wife for Isaac, he came with carts full of gifts, right? Gave camels and gave all kinds of jewelry and gave all kinds of things. And so Laban may have been expecting that he was going to be greeted with the same sort of generosity. But Jacob came empty-handed, unlike Eleazar of Damascus. So perhaps Laban thought that this was going to be advantageous for him. It wasn't advantageous for him. And now he's putting Jacob at a bit of a distance. Now he's going to treat him as one of his hired servants. He's going to pay him. And you have to remember that sometimes we read into this like Jacob shows up there and he's sort of a, an adolescent youth who can be taken care of or who can be taken advantage of. But remember that Jacob is coming to him as a fully grown man who's been overseeing the household duties. He's been the household manager of Isaac's estate for years at this point. So he's a mature man. And so as a mature man who's very capable, he comes in and perhaps Laban saw that as a bit of a threat. We're not quite sure. And we always have to be careful when we're reading into things. 
But we do see that there's some sort of a difference between calling him a family member, staying with him for a month, and then after that month suddenly saying, now I'm going to start paying you. I'm going to start treating you like one of my hired servants. And I think that that can sort of, that second reading can sort of be verified because we get to see sort of a glimpse of Laban's character. We'll see it not only in this chapter, but in the chapters to come as well. So the third thing that happens is that Jacob worked for seven years to marry Rachel, only to be deceived into marrying Leah instead. So starting in verse 16, it says, Now Laban had two daughters. The name of the older was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah's eyes were weak, but Rachel was beautiful in form and appearance, and Jacob loved Rachel. So there's two daughters, and their names here, so bear with me for a moment, especially I know we are in a, a church where lots of um, kids are coming. So uh, Leah and Rachel, two lovely names. Uh, Leah means uh, cow, and Rachel means sheep. Or more specifically, it actually, female cow, female sheep. So uh, Leah means heifer, and uh, Rachel means ewe. Now, as you think about that, I know... Nobody other than maybe Jan Mulder thinks that naming somebody a cow would be uh, anything but a uh, term of endearment. But you have to remember that these people are essentially, they're naming, like, it, it, that would have been, a, that would have been a, a, nice, a nice name, right? They would have thought that these animals, these animals were tied to their livelihood. These animals were tied to the, the wealth of their estate. Um, but interestingly... You have, and I think that this is interesting that you eventually have in the sacrificial system. So if you want to just do some cool homework, um, you can go and start looking that up. Um, do a study this week on some of the sacrificial animals that are used when the sacrificial system comes up and how I think uh, Rachel and Leah actually symbolize as the heifer and the, the sheep. Um, but uh, it says that Leah had weak eyes. Now, there are a number of things that this could mean. Uh, generally, commentators have said that this means that she wasn't very attractive, which is why she was the older but unmarried sister, and Jacob needed to be tricked into marrying her. And that could be it. That could be what it means. But this word that we translate weak is literally the word soft. And it can mean weak. It can mean delicate. It can mean naive. Or it can even mean pretty. So it could be that her eyes were weak, which meant that her judgment was off. But I don't think that's it because later on we see that she praises God when he gives her children. It could be that she had, was delicate or naive, which I think is a pretty good reading because we see how easily she becomes manipulated by her father. She seems like a bit of a, a pushover as uh, you get to know Leah. Um, someone who goes along with things, unlike Rachel, who is a little bit more assertive, a little bit more like Rebecca. Or it could mean that she had pretty eyes and that that was her one good feature, which is maybe why Jacob was tricked in the tent into thinking that she was Rachel because Rachel was beautiful it says in form and appearance so she was beautiful all over Leah perhaps had pretty eyes and their veils would have covered everything on the head except the eyes so it could be any one of those things we're not exactly told but um, you can kind of decide which of those uh, uh, words it could maybe mean Rachel is compared to Rebecca um, remember that in chapter 24 verse 16 we're told that Rebecca is fair in form and beautiful to look at as well. So Rebecca and Rachel are compared. They were beautiful. And at any rate, the most important piece of any of this is that Jacob loved and wanted to marry Rachel, not Leah. Now this working for Rachel is actually proper, um, though God's law later on will say that um, the most that somebody can ask in terms of a, a price for their daughter is 50 shekels, and if you work this out, seven years of wages is about 150 shekels. So Laban is looking a little bit greedy in what he asks um, Jacob to, uh, uh, to work for her. But it's interesting that after he works for her, it says that it se they seemed only as a couple days to him. Which again, kind of shows Jacob's love for Rachel. But even more than that, the other thing that it shows is that remember that at the end of um, the chapter when Rebecca and Isaac sent Jacob off. They said that he would only be gone, go and visit for a couple of days. And so the idea here is that it only seemed like a couple of days to uh, Jacob, even though it was seven years, because he was working for one that he loved so much. So you have this, it says, um, sorry, it says in verse uh, 19, 
Uh, Laban said, it's better that I give her to you than I should give her to any other man. Stay with me. Some have, have kind of pointed to that and said that he doesn't say Rachel's name there, so perhaps Laban was being a little bit tricky. Perhaps he was saying, it's better that I give her to you, and he was being a little bit tricky. But I think when you see them go back, it was obvious what Laban was doing. It was obvious that the arrangement was for Rachel. Jacob, um, it says in verse 20, so Jacob served seven years for Rachel. They seemed to him but a few days because of the love that he had for her. Then Jacob said to Laban, give me my wife that I may go into her, for my time is completed. Now notice that he says, give me my wife. And that's because in Hebrew culture, betrothment is considered marriage, it was, except for the act of consummating the marriage. So essentially what Jacob is saying, he already considers Rachel his wife. He's saying, let me consummate the marriage. And once again, one of the things that we see in this passage is that the Bible equates the act of marital intimacy as the act of marriage, right? So the moment that he goes into Leah, the moment that he consummates a marriage with Leah, it's not like that can be annulled. It's not like that can be erased. He doesn't then just discard her. If we were living in our modern culture, people would be like, oh, that was a big mistake. Now, where's Rachel? Right? But, this, but the Bible sees the act of consummating a marriage as marriage itself. And I just say that if, specifically, I mean, obviously, it, it's obvious to those who are, are married, but my application here would be for everybody who is not married, recognize that biblically speaking, when you give yourself to someone else, the Bible sees you as married. This is why fornication is such an awful sin in Scripture. So be careful with your body. It says in verse 22, so Laban gathered together all the people of the place and made a feast. And that word for feast, um, there's many words that mean feast in the Hebrew language. This one definitely implies drinking. And so the idea here is that his faculties would be inhibited. And with seven years of anticipation and his faculties inhibited, Jacob is tricked. It says in the evening, he took his daughter Leah and brought her to Jacob and he went into her. And so Leah and Jacob are married. Next thing we see, and one of the things you can think about, and I was just thinking about this, and I don't think we can draw any definitive conclusions, but my question is, where's Rachel in all of this? Right? And you can kind of have some fun thinking. Like, was she tied up in a tent far away? Was she sort of like not knowing? Was she sent on a, a journey? She wasn't quite sure what was going on. Was she culpable in this? Was Leah culpable in this? Obviously, she knew what was going on. She didn't say anything before um, everything took place. Was her culpability in all of this part of the reason that Jacob disdains her later on? We're not quite, quite told. And I don't think we're necessarily meant to speculate about all those details, but they are interesting to think about. I think what we can focus on is Jacob. And so let's do one more thing before we get to a big idea. Fourth thing that takes place is in order to marry Rachel, the bride he loved... Jacob agreed to work another seven years. So verse 25 says, And in the morning, behold, it was Leah. And Jacob said to Laban, What is this that you have done to me? Did I not serve you for Rachel? Why then have you deceived me? Laban said, It is not so done in our country to give the younger before the firstborn. Now notice it's interesting because firstborn is generally a term that's used for male firstborns, not for female firstborns. And so Laban's obviously had seven years to think up how he's going to play this. He's had seven years to come up with his response to Jacob. And so when Jacob comes and says, like, what have you done? Essentially what Laban's doing here is I think what Laban is, is doing is kind of hinting at, you know, I know, I know that you, the second born, got tricked in, or tricked the first born and there's an old switcheroo. We don't do that kind of stuff over here. And so there's, there's sort of an implication like, hey, Jacob, you've told me the stories right? You deceived Esau, right? You deceived your father, right? So don't, don't go turning this around on me. We're both deceivers here. And so I think that's what's going on here. And we do get a bit of an eye for an eye here with, uh, with the deception. Um, Jacob certainly gets to feel in this moment what it would have been like to be Esau. But um, Laban obviously knew the stories, and perhaps this is part of the, the schism that happened when he, he, he welcomed Jacob in as a uh, family and then started to treat him as a hired servant. Maybe part of that transition was he started to hear the stories of how he tricked Esau, heard the story of how he tricked Isaac. He didn't want to be tricked. He didn't want to be usurped. And so he began to treat um, Jacob differently. Now, of course, he still gave him his daughters, so he couldn't have thought that poorly of him. 
but Jacob agrees to work another seven years. And notice how it says, Laban says, um, complete the week for this one. In other words, complete the honeymoon week, complete the bridal week, then I'll give you Rachel, then you work another seven years. And that's how the text ends. It says, so Jacob went into Rachel also. He loved Rachel more than Leah, and he served Laban another seven years. That's not, a, that's not 21 years altogether. That's seven years, then he gets Leah, then he completes the bridal week for Leah, then he gets Rachel, then he serves another seven years. So Leah didn't even get, you know, seven years with Rachel or with Jacob before Rachel came into the picture. So we'll get into some of the complications as they start having kids and we'll get through that, that sort of um, sisterly relationship next week. But what's the big idea here? In all this complication, rather than speculate about who did what and, and what all these things mean, here's a big idea that I think we can understand and can kind of train us in godliness from this text. God uses hardship to mature his covenant people so they can build his kingdom faithfully. God uses hardship to mature his covenant people so they can build his kingdom faithfully. It's a clear teaching of scripture that God uses hardship to mature his people. This is what molds and shapes us. Whether it was Moses, once called by God, who was sent into the wilderness for a number of years, God's people that he delivered from, uh, from Egypt and then let them mature in the wilderness for 40 years, God always seems to, even after Jesus' own baptism, it says the Spirit of God led him into the wilderness for 40 days where he was tempted. God will always bring hardship and difficulty into the lives of his people in order to mature them. These are hard truths, and I don't want to merely say hard things to you. I want you to understand this truth directly from the Word of God. So what I want to do is I want to take three New Testament passages that teach this principle and I want to walk through them. The first is in Hebrews chapter 12. So obviously this was a difficult time for Jacob. It says that the first seven years seemed like only a few days to him. But obviously that second seven years would have seemed much longer after being tricked into marrying Leah. And the entire ordeal of sort of being treated like family and then being treated like a servant and then being tricked into 14 years of servitude, um, this is difficult for Jacob, but what we're going to see is that it actually matures him and readies him for being the patriarch that he's called to be. Genesis, or Hebrews chapter 12, I'm actually going to read the first 17 verses of this chapter. Therefore, <clears throat> since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who, for the joy was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Now just pause there for a moment. Notice it starts with a therefore, so we ask what it's there for. That therefore, at the beginning of chapter 12, is because chapter 11 lays out all of the various heroes of the faith who endured hardship, it says. Some of them suffered death, some of them suffered scorn, some of them suffered all kinds of various things, and yet it says that they remained faithful. And so, since we're surrounded by such a great testimony of heroes of the faith who have endured hardship and yet remained faithful, it's saying, let us also lay aside every weight, every hardship, every difficulty, everything that ensnares us, all the sin that ensnares us, and let us look to Jesus, who we are to mimic, who also endured hardship. It says, endured hardship to the point of going to the cross. Now consider, this is verse 3, consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. In your own struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood, and you have not forgotten, have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves, and chastises every son whom he receives. In other words, if you are a legitimate son, you will receive hardship and difficulty that's handcrafted for you, that's coming to you from the hand of your father. Verse 7, 
It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline, in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them, but he disciplines us for our good, that we may share in his holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Therefore, lift your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed. Strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble and by it become defiled that no one is sexually immoral or unholy like Esau who sold his birthright for a single meal. For you know that afterward, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected for he found no chance to repent, though he sought it with tears. So what this is saying is that the difficulty that we encounter in our lives because we belong to God, we can receive all of the difficulty that takes place in our lives, all the hardship that we experience as discipline from a loving father. Now, that's a difficult analogy for those of us who did not have loving fathers who disciplined us lovingly, okay? So if you had a father who was abusive, you had a father who was neglectful, you had a father who wasn't loving, or you didn't have a father, this is a difficult analogy for you to understand. But what we're made to understand is that a good earthly father disciplines his children. In other words, he disciplines them when they do something wrong, and he allows them to walk through certain things. The helicopter parent that doesn't allow their child to interact with anything in the world around them is not equipping that child to interact with the world. A good father, a good mother, good parents, they watch their children, they protect their children, but they also allow their children to stumble and fall at times. They allow their children to experience difficulty. They allow their children to do things that are too hard for them to do right now so that they can learn how to do hard things and not crumble under the pressure. We live in a world where people are so afraid of discipline. People are so afraid of disciplining children. In fact, one of the reasons why after the, uh, whatever it was, the 2020 election, no, it wouldn't have been 2020, the 2016 election when Donald Trump got elected, one of the reasons we saw the world collectively lose its mind is because you had a bunch of undisciplined children who all at one time realized collectively together that the world isn't going to work out exactly the way they wanted it to. That's what was going on. That was, the, that was the social rebellion that was going on is because what each of those young people who grew up without discipline would have learned at their first job interview or the first time they got fired or the first time they got rejected, they would have learned individually. They all learned collectively when things didn't work out the way they wanted to. And we saw the hissy fit that took place. And so what this is teaching us is that hardship and difficulty in our lives is not something that needs to be cursed not something that needs to be avoided, but something that actually molds and shapes us into the men and women of God that God is calling us to be. Now, it is absolutely human nature for you to say, yeah, but did God have to discipline me this way? Couldn't he discipline me like he disciplined Susie over there? Her life seems so easy. I don't know what discipline she's receiving, but boy, I could use some of that. We have a tendency, if we are undergoing financial difficulty, to say, I could endure any hardship except financial difficulty. If only my, my plights were like somebody else's. And somebody else who is having marital difficulties is saying, if only my marriage was solid. I could take financial difficulty. I could take mocking. I could take whatever. It, it's human nature that whatever difficulty we particularly are walking through, for us to say, it would be better if we had that person's difficulty. But know that the difficulty you are going through is not random. God did not choose it out of a bingo ball dispenser, right? God chose it. He handcrafted it in order to mold and shape you into the kind of man, the kind of woman that he needs you to be so that you can build his kingdom. 
I'm sure Jacob would have rathered any sort of difficulty. Give me hardship. Give me toil. Give me financial difficulty. Give me this. Just don't let my brother try to kill me. Just don't give me a wife that I didn't ask for. But we don't get to choose what hardship is placed in our lives. God chooses that. The question is, do we trust him? Next, you can go to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, I'm going to start in verse 3. Blessed be the God of our Father, of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in our affliction so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as we share abundantly in Christ's suffering, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. If we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and your salvation. And if we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which you experience when you patiently endure the same sufferings that we suffer. Our hope for you is unshaken, for we know that as you share in our sufferings, you will also share in our comfort. Now, what sufferings is the Apostle Paul talking about? Well, verse 8, For we do not want you to be unaware, brothers, of the affliction we experienced in Asia, for we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired for life itself. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death, but that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. He delivered us from such deadly peril, and he will deliver us. On him we have set our hope that he will deliver us again. You must also help us by prayer so that many will give thanks on our behalf for the blessing granted us through the prayers of many. So the Apostle Paul recognized that there was difficulty for him that he experienced in Asia, and we could speculate, though this isn't the text that we're preaching on today, so we won't, what that difficulty was, but it says that actually made him despair of life itself. The Apostle Paul had dark thoughts about going on in life because of the despair that he received in Asia. And it was such deadly peril, he says, but it made him rely on God and it then strengthens him because when God delivers you from one thing, it strengthens your faith that he'll deliver you from the next thing. One of the things that we are meant to look at when we are in the midst of difficulty is not only back in our own lives, but as the text says, back in the lives of those that are around us, church family members, friends, mentors. And these stories of God's faithfulness in the midst of difficulty is meant to put steel in our spines to be strengthened for the difficulty that we're currently going through. And part of the difficulty that you're going through is equipping you to be of help to the next person in line who's going to suffer with something similar. This is why church community is so vital. This is why if you slip in on Sunday mornings and slip out and aren't involved in the community and you don't hear the testimonies, you don't hear the prayer requests in small groups, you are only scratching the surface of what God has for you in Christian church. Because the testimonies of God's faithfulness in the lives of others is necessary to be able to strengthen you and comfort you for the difficulties that you will face, will face, if you're legitimate sons. One more passage, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 7 to 18. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 7 to 18. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. For we who live are always being given over to, the death, to death for Jesus' sake so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. Since we have the same spirit of faith according to what has been written, I believed and so I spoke. We also believe and so we also speak. 
knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and bring us with you into his presence. For it is all for your sake, so that as grace extends to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. So we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light, momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison, as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Now, what is that saying? I mean, depending on what you're going through, it can be saying a number of different things. I think the Apostle Paul's body was literally wasting away at this time. He had been beaten, he had been scorned, he had been stoned, he had been whipped, he had been hit with the rod. I think his body was literally kind of wasting away on him. And there are some of you, whether it's a bad diagnosis, whether it's illness that you're battling or a loved one is battling, you can, you can relate to this because the light momentary affliction, Paul says, of what's going on right now has nothing to do. It doesn't even compare to the eternal weight of glory. In other words, there is a reality. There is a resurrection body. There is a resurrection existence. There is eternal life beyond this that is so much better than anything that I can experience here that whatever happens to me here and whatever death is waiting for me here, it doesn't compare to the eternal life that I get. But that's not the only thing that's unseen. The other thing that's unseen is what we're called to look at in Hebrews chapter 11, and that is the purposes of God being manifested on the earth. So when we look at Canada, one of the things that we hear all the time here is that we, we were, this was a church family that God forged in the furnace of difficulty, trial and tribulation during a very dark time. And we all had family and friends who moved away, right? We all had family and friends who, who's, um, and I want to be careful, I don't want to be disrespectful in any way, but who, who decided that what they were going to do was going to go to greener pastures. And one of the things that made me feel absolutely convinced and convicted to stay is these kinds of passages right here. This light momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory. We look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. I spend a vast more majority of my time not looking at how bad the world is around us, how bad the political landscape in Canada is, how bad our politicians are, how terrible our school systems are. I spend such a small amount of time thinking about looking at that stuff as I do thinking about what God has promised for Canada. And what God has promised for Canada is that Christ will have dominion from sea to sea into the ends of the earth. God has promised that he will bless faithful advancement of the gospel. God has promised that the harvest is not small, it's the workers who are few. And so when we look to those kinds of promises and we rest our minds on the things that are unseen, we live and we work towards the things that are unseen. We don't live and work in the fear of what is, we live and work towards what's unseen. Knowing that whatever we're afflicted with, whatever happens, if I'm one of the pastors that eventually has to go to jail because of all of the censorship um, legislation that's going through, then I will know that that is a light and momentary affliction that does not compare to the eternal weight of glory. And so we know that whatever difficulty God has for us, whatever family relational difficulty, whatever diagnosis, whatever illnesses, whatever losses, whatever lumps we take, we know that they do not compare to what God has for us. And like all the patriarchs and all the heroes of faith in Hebrews chapter 11, we look to the things that are unseen. So a couple of points of application as I close. Number one, in a world abounding with Labans, every Christian is going to encounter one. There are going to be Labans in your life, people who want to take advantage of you, people who will mistreat you, people who take advantage, people who manipulate, you're going to have that. You're going to have unkind doctors and nurses. You are going to have um, loud neighbors. You're going to have naysayers. You're going to have family members who hate you. You're going to have 
all kinds of difficulties. You're going to have that boss who has it in for you. We're all going to encounter Labans in the world. The question is, do we allow the Labans of the world, do we allow the people who take advantage of us, the people who mock us, the people who push us down, the difficulties that ensnare us, do we allow those things to break us? Or is it, like 2 Corinthians chapter 4 says, that those things afflict us but don't crush us, perplex us but don't drive us to despair, persecute us but we aren't forsaken, strike us down but we're not destroyed. Don't allow the Labans of the world to minimize your Christian influence and to ruin your kingdom work. Second point of application is this. God's people are built or sorry, God's people are to build his kingdom by taking dominion of the hard things that the Lord gives them. I don't know what the hard thing is that God has given to you. Maybe it's a health diagnosis. Maybe it's the loss of a loved one. Maybe it's financial difficulty right now when things are getting tighter and tighter for everybody. I'm not sure what hard thing God has given to you. But just like a good father who gives hard challenges to their children in order to train them, in order to overcome difficulties, God's given that to you so that you can take dominion of it, so that you can overcome it, so that you can be trained by it, so that you can be equipped by it. Dominion means to subdue, to conquer, to bring about the flourishing of. What has God given you that right now looks like thorns and thistles that you need to turn into a garden? A tough work environment, an ungodly place of business, a business full of DEI policies that make it hard for you to be a Christian? What does it look like for you to take dominion there? What does it look like for you to bring about the flourishing of the dramatic and difficult and strained family that God has given to you? The difficult child that you have the rebellious child that you've been given, how can you bring about the flourishing of the hard thing that God has given to you? Don't shrink away. Don't divert your attention. Don't despair that God gave you this hard thing because God has given you a hard thing, but he's also given you all the tools necessary and the church family around you that can equip you to take dominion of it. And as we all take dominion of the hard things that God has given to us, God's kingdom is built in our midst and we'll see its flourishing, if not in our lifetime, then when we're all gathered together in eternity. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you and we love your word. And we thank you, Lord, that even though these stories that we are reading took place over 4,000 years ago, we thank you, Lord, that they can be relevant for us here and now. Thank you that they can teach us. We thank you, Lord, that they can train us. And I pray that they would. I pray, Lord, for all of the difficulties that people are going through in this church. We know that there are some who are struggling with starting a family, those who are struggling with the family that they have, those who are struggling financially, those who are struggling just to get by. We know that there are those who are struggling with strained or cut off family ties and there are those who feel the overwhelming um, sort of uh, smothering nature of their families and so lord we can be afflicted in all kinds of different ways but we thank you lord that as you continue to grow this church one thing is for sure that we have all been afflicted in various ways and that has trained us that we can help those who are similarly afflicted help us lord to be a church family that takes care of one another that comforts one another, that helps one another, and that points to one another, points one another to the things that are unseen. So we can be a church family that does not allow the root of bitterness to rise up within us as we look to all the things we don't have or all the things that we're suffering with. But instead, Lord, that the root of joy would spring up within us as we look to the things that we're working towards. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.